216. On July 1st, 2012, a Japanese company enters into a forward contract to buy $1 million with yen on January 1st, 2013. On September 1st, 2012, it enters into a forward contract to sell $1 million on January 1st, 2013. Describe the profit or loss the company will make in yen as a function of the forward exchange rates on July 1st, 2012 and September 1st, 2012. So our profit and loss are going to be in yen. Pay attention to that. Let's do our timeline so that we can describe it a little bit better. I mean, keeping in mind that we're, we're concerned about yen, right? So on July, in July of 2012, what did we do? We entered into a forward contract to buy $1 million with yen. So we are long $1 million, aren't we? We're long $1 million because if the U.S. dollar increases in value against the yen, we win. If it decreases in value, we lose. And that is for delivery in January of 13, all the way over here. On September 1st of 2012, we are now short $1 million. And that is for delivery here. So on January 1st, we're going to take delivery of a million dollars and then immediately supply it to our short position. So in essence, these two positions mean that we have no more risk. We basically have closed our risk position even though we have two forward contracts open. If this were futures, uh, they cancel each other out and we would be considered flat at that point. We would be done and over with. But these are forward contracts. So we have two forward contracts open that will expire January 13th, but we've locked in prices. So as far as September is concerned, we know what our profit and loss is. So let's just take an example. Let's say that we entered into, in July, we entered into a contract that had a forward price of 100 yen per dollar. So on January 13th, uh, we would provide, we would spend 100 yen for every dollar and we would take delivery of one million dollars. If the yen were trading at 120 yen per dollar, well, we're, we're doing pretty good because we only need 100 yen per dollar to buy, or 100 yen to buy every US dollar instead of 120. So if the yen decreases in value, in other words, it goes from 100 yen per dollar to 120, we win. We're doing very good. But if it goes from 100 yen down to 80 yen, ah, oh, well, it would have been better off. We would have been better off waiting and not using the forward contract because then it would have only cost us 80 yen to buy every US dollar. Uh, but now we got to pay 100. So if the price drops, uh, sorry, if the US dollar uh, drops in value and the yen increases in value, it'll cost us more. So we want the yen to depreciate. So we can look at F1. And we can look at it under two scenarios. If, the, if at F1 the yen is 120 uh, yen per dollar, here's what's going to happen. We're short here, right? So on January 1st, we're going to put out 100 yen to get every dollar. We're going to then deliver this dollar to the short position who will then provide us with 120 yen. So we make money. Remember, how much will we make in yen? So we'll make money. But if the yen is at $80, let's just put our, if the yen is at 80, what's going to happen on January 1st is we will take 100 yen and we will buy every dollar. We will then deliver that dollar under the short contract, but only receive 80 yen in return, which means we have a loss. So now that we have it clear, we can answer the question that is being asked of us. It's, it's, it's asking us to... Uh, describe the profit or loss the company will make in yen as a function of the forward exchange rates on July 1st and September 1st. So we'll let F0 be the forward rate that we got on July and F1 be the forward rate we got uh, on September. So we will profit if, if the F0 yen dollar, whatever we got here, is less than the F1 yen dollar exchange rate. Here it's 100 yen per dollar. F1 is 120 yen per dollar, so we have a profit. As long as the, as the forward rate we entered into in July in yen is less than the forward rate we entered into 
in September. And we will we have a loss if the forward rate at F naught, if the yen, sorry, the yen dollar is greater than the yen dollar at F1. I think you see that. Currencies can be a little bit tricky, which is why when you get questions on currencies, draw out your timeline and think about what you need to do because there's always two involved. You are implicitly, when you're long one, you are implicitly short the other one. So what currency am I making my profit or loss in? And start thinking about it in those terms. But it is tricky, and I'll be honest with you, even now there are times I get a currency question where there's multiple steps involved. Uh, I got to think it through. It, it's, it's not automatic because I got to keep jumping from, well, okay, I'm on this currency, long here, so I'm short there, and if I'm short there, I'm long another one, which... Sometimes it can get tricky. 228. One orange juice futures contract is on 15,000 pounds of frozen concentrate. Suppose that in September of 2011, a company sells a March 2013 contract for 120 cents per pound. In December of 2011, the futures price is 140 cents. December 2012, it is 110 cents. And in February 2013, it is closed for 125 cents company has a December 31st year end or December year end. What is the company's P&L on the contract? How is it realized? What is the accounting and tax treatment of the transaction if the company is classified as a hedger and a speculator? So let's draw our timeline because this is a rather long one and let's see what we have here in drawing this out. We have September of 2011. We are short. We entered into, uh, um, we sold a March 13 contract for 120. So we're short at 120. And on December of 2011, we had a price of 140. In December of 2012, the price was 110. In February of 13, the price was 125. And these were March 13th contracts. We'll put the March 13 in, even though we don't need it. So we're closed out. What do we have here? We have some distinct periods. That's the end of the first year. There's the end of the second year. There's the end of our third period. So we have December 31st at December 2011. Uh, we have December 2012. And then this final amount goes into 2013. So all that's left is to figure out how much each one represents. Now we're short. So as the price goes up, it hurts us. The underlying is for 15,000 pounds. So this went up 20 cents. So negative 0.20 because it hurts us. We don't want it to go up. Times 15,000 pounds is negative $3,000. So we have a loss of $3,000 during that period. Here we went from 140 to 110, which helps us. The price went down 30 cents, which is good for 15,000 pounds, which means during that year, we're up $4,500. Then from December to February, 110 to 115, it went the wrong way on us by 0.15 times 15,000 pounds is negative 2,250. Put our dollar signs in there. So if we add across here, uh, we have negative 3,000 plus 4,500. We're up 1,500. Now we're down 2,250. That will equal a negative $750 uh, loss on the contract. So we have a $750 loss. There's the first question. What is the company's P&L on the contract? How is it realized? Well, um, what did we enter into? We have futures contracts. These are realized daily. These are daily settlements. So it's not realized all at once. It's realized every single day we have marked to market. Uh, what is the accounting and tax treatment of the transaction if the company is classified as a hedger and a speculator? Well, if you are a hedger, this is all you have to worry about is the $750. And you would, uh, as far as taxes are concerned, that would land on the December uh, 2013 uh, a statement as a loss and if you were a speculator uh, you would have you would recognize a loss at the end of this year you would recognize a gain at the end of this year and you would recognize a loss at the end of 2013 
uh, for the full amount, uh, which would be 2250. So you'd have a, a loss of 3,000 in fiscal 2011, a gain of 4,500 in fiscal 2012, and a loss of 2250 in fiscal in fiscal year 2013. Whereas the hedger would just have one loss of 750, uh, which would be offset against the eventual purchase. Uh, so it wouldn't show up as a loss on the statements. As far as accounting is concerned, it wouldn't be treated as a line item that says loss on, on futures. It would be part of their active cost of goods sold. It would be reflected in the price of the cost of goods sold that they purchased. So it would be rolled into inventory and it would show up in cost of goods sold. They have a $750 loss on the contract. But if they hedged appropriately and bought in the spot market, they would have paid probably $750 less in the spot market. So their cost of goods sold, their inventory purchases, would have dropped by $750, but the loss on the hedging would have brought it back up by $750. That's the idea behind hedging, is you lock in a price uh, well before time. Now, one thing I want to point out before you go, it's not part of the question, but I'm going to point it out because this is important to know. This loss down here, is not a capital loss. That's the beautiful thing about these type of losses is it's an income loss. So if you're in a very high tax bracket, guess what? This comes straight off your income. So if you're in the 48, 49% tax bracket like Canada has for its upper taxes, that $3,000 loss is really only about a 15 or $1,600 loss. Uh, but uh, this gain, well, guess what? That gets taxed, uh, that, that pushes your income even higher, so that gets taxed uh, as well. So these kind of losses and these kind of gains, they're income losses and income gains. They go on to your income. They don't get treated like capital gains or dividends. It's important to stress that.